risk reduction methodology, uh, we're doing exactly what we do at Dryden on other programs. 50 years worth of experience is we do a time-proven incremental build-up flight test and envelope expansion approach. You go fairly low and slow. You start off. You don't try to do everything all at once. Then you kind of earn your way as you go. You go to higher altitudes and airspeeds as you get data, analyze it, and make sure that you're not doing something dumb and is understood. We're going to fly the droid to high altitude by itself to characterize the performance. We've only had it to about 3,500 feet. Uh, we know that the engines on the droid um, with other people have gone to as high as 17,000 feet, but that doesn't mean we've got our mixtures set up properly you know, for the altitude because you need to have the motor set fairly lean and also the flying qualities. We're going to fly a single fuselage glider while we finish building this with a camera out the nose because we don't have a lot of experience towing flying gliders or flying uh, vehicles in tow or remotely piloted behind something. And as probably some of you have seen, if you get a little bit out of whack in terms of the orientation of the glider to the tow plane, it, it's not a pretty day. You can really make a mess of things for the tow plane, and we don't want to break anything. Uh, so we're going to fly a single fuse glider. Um, the twin fuse glider, we're probably going to do a ground tow behind a truck with about a three or 400 foot line, just lift off and ground effect and make sure everything's working properly and so forth before we commit to going to altitude in tow. And then we'll do the flight tow test behind the droid. This is some pictures of the custom wing center section structure that was put together by Leslie. It's an aluminum structure. It's an aluminum rib that is water cut. There is a joiner plate with fasteners on each side. And then there's a uh, machined, um, I'm sure what to call it, a spar tip out here. We kept the original spa wing design on the outer panel so we didn't have to modify it. So the way we designed the wing center section interface to the airplane is as if it was a stock wing. So the airplane plugs together. You can take the airplane apart in about a minute. But the key thing on this is there's carbon fiber end cap that gets built on that. Uh, the swing structure is a laminate, uh, two layers of carbon outer structure with a 32nd inch and 16th inch ingrained balsa uh, layup. There's a test sample over there. It's stiffer in a cob. The reason we put the second uh, a uh, layer of glass on it uh, actually was for dent resistance. It was plenty strong with one layer on each side, but it was a little soft as far as handling. But the, uh, it, you have to understand, and, and I didn't put this in the cons, but I probably should have. One of the downsides, probably the major downside of doing this approach of air launching something is, the entire weight of the rocket is at the center line of the airplane. You have no span loading going on. So normal airplane fuel out in the wings the wing bending isn't that, in fact, as you burn off fuel, if they try to burn off the fuel at the center of the airplane first, because that actually gives you increased structural margin and it helps with the ride qualities. Having all of the way to the center section is rather onerous from a wing bending point of view. That's made the spar design very, very difficult on this. So the, it's, it's going to be basically utility class rated as far as the structural load of 4.5G airplane. If you think about it, it's a 160-pound airplane at takeoff, so that wing spar's got to be able to handle around uh, 700 pounds of weight. Not many airplanes, if any in here, could do that other than the full scale could handle that sort of a load. This is the tow release system for the tow rope. Uh, it's very similar to an off-the-shelf stu uh, stuff that you can get from Hobby Lobby and others. We just changed the form factor so that it bolted onto the side. But basically the way it's set up is you've got the loop of the tow line comes in one end. There's a hole that runs through this and it loops around the hook and it's simply servo driven to release the tow line. We're going to be able to release the tow both at the droid location and also on the glider. Just for redundancy and because you can, it'd be kind of dumb if you only had one and you couldn't release it. I'm sure that's been done before. This is the launch hook release system for carrying the rocket. It's a scaled down version of something we've flown on a bigger UAV in the past. But basically you've got a pin or a couple of pins if you use multiple hooks that fits up that are mounted horizontal in the top skin of the, of the rocket. And you simply fit it up into that slot and by pushing that lever that way with a linkage it closes. And uh, the interesting thing about this is the load on the edge of that hook as it opens up actually in theory goes to infinity for an infinite amount of short or infinitely short amount of piece of time. Um, so you do actually have to pay attention to the hook loads on that. But this whole assembly is about this tall and will easily handle a couple hundred pounds. This is the instrumentation layout on the twin glider. Uh, we have 12 aerodynamic control surfaces and four oh, blade spoilers, I guess you would call them, speed brakes. Um, the stock airplane has them on the wing right here. Uh, 
we've got these, and, and one of the things you have to think about when you do this is you've got all these surfaces that are all instrumented, so you've got to come up with a name for the parameter for each one of the surfaces of your instrumentation. So we have outboard left aileron, inboard left aileron, outboard left flap, inboard left flap, outboard left spoiler, inboard left spoiler, and then the right-hand version of everything, uh, left elevator, left rudder, right rudder, elevator, Plus, we've got nose booms on the airplane to get the air data, which is P-total, P-static, and alpha and beta, which is your angle of attack and side slip. And we've got a standard nose boom, a miniature knack of a nose boom, and also a, a low sp speed version of it, because the wide speed range of the glider is all the way from maybe 20 knots up towards of over 100 or close to it. And the average nose boom won't perform down in the 20 range. So this, this one, the veins on it are, are, are actually balsa versus aluminum and so forth. Got the Piccolo autopilot. We've got a differential GPS on it with an accuracy of better than a fraction of an inch. Uh, and then we've got the uh, left-hand instrumentation, right-hand instrumentation system. It's a very, very intense uh, airplane. Plus we've got the video, that's what's not on here, I forgot about, is the video system. We'll have one camera facing down um, right at the base of the center fuselage looking down so we can see the payload is released. We've got another camera at the nose for the pilot's perspective. Haven't figured out where the other two are gonna go yet or even if we know where to fit them, but at least we have that option. How do you get the L over D on the airplane? That's the big question. It used to be in the olden days uh, before GPS, you had high accuracy accelerometers and you flew at a variety of airspeeds and it would give you the angle of the aircraft coming through the air and you could basically calculate what the flight uh, glide slope of the airplane was. Lift over drag is the arc tangent of your flight path angle. So it's how far, if, if you glide straight level for 30 seconds and just to, to make it easy to do the math, if you're going 60 mile an hour, 30 seconds, that's a half a mile. Okay, if your L over D is 20, Half a mile is 25,000 or 2,500 feet roughly. In, in, in L over D at 20, you will have dropped on the order of about, let's see, what is that, about 50 feet? I think that's right, yeah, roughly 50 feet. So if your accuracy is, so the 50 feet is 600 inches, and you're accurate to half an inch, so you're at about a quarter of a percent accuracy. That's pretty awfully good. So the idea is to use a differential GPS, and we call that sync rate method. You fly constant airspeed, because different airspeeds, you get a different glide angle. And basically, we're trying to find out what the L over D is as a function of airspeed. So you do a bunch of glides from altitude at a constant airspeed for 30 to 100 seconds, do five or six of them. And then essentially, you need to do it in calm air, zero side slip, fairly constant temperature, need calibrated airspeed, and the accurate altitude comes off the GPS. Um, then you can figure out by ferrying a line through all these data points you have what your L over D is, which is just simply engineering. There's also something called a pushover pull-up maneuver called a POPU that gives you the same sort of information as you sweep an angle of attack range. And what it does, it gives it to you as a function of load factor also because it's a flexible airplane and the aerodynamics will change as you load up and change the shape of the airplane. Very few airplanes are rigid. Summary approach, we're going to flight investigate the concept and assess its viability. We're going to do that utilizing a rapid incremental buildup risk management, risk mitigation approach, earning our way as we go. We've got three distinct flight phases over five years, each designed to reduce the risk in different areas. The objective is to understand the performance, operational and safety benefits and disadvantages possible from the concept from each of the three phases. The end result, which is the third phase airplane, is an X-plane flight demonstrator program. The intent is to transfer the technology to the commercial sector until it is viable and being used. We would support launches off of the X-plane until it becomes fully transitioned. We would also use the vehicle to support in aeronautical research like X-15, lifting body launches, and so on and so forth.